Okay. Wow, this is intimidating. <laughs> it's like a gauntlet or something. Um, so thank you, Jack. As he said, I'm Joe Morenda. I currently am the Farm Policy Director of the Organic Trade Association. Um, I work from home up in White River Junction, Vermont. So it's not too far for me to come down and uh, join you guys today. Um, my role there is um, to fulfill the mission of the OTA to pr promote and protect organic. Um, in my role, the specific uh, focus is on um, the crop and livestock sections of the NOP regulations. Now, the question of whether the NOP is doing its job uh, is an important one, and so important that it was the topic of a congressional hearing about two weeks ago. Um, so the House Agriculture Subcommittee on Biotechnology and Horticulture, the committee that oversees organic, um, held a hearing titled Assessing the Effectiveness of the National Organic Program. And they invited two members, excuse me, uh, of USDA staff, um, the Undersecretary of the Agricultural Marketing Service, Greg Ibach, and Dr. Jenny Tucker, the Deputy Director, Director of the NOP. And the, the USDA staff was able to give a report to the committee. The committee members asked questions and the members of Congress did not let them off the hook. So if anybody watched or live streamed that hearing like I did, you aren't gonna be surprised with what I bring to you today. And it's gonna be, a here's a spoiler alert, I'm not taking a yes position fully. Um, the NOP's job is, is an enormous responsibility to oversee and enforce the most highly regulated food system in the world, to regulate market access for organic products into the US, the largest market in the world. And they're doing that all within the conditions of the USDA, which you can imagine is quite difficult um, with the conflicting priorities and limited resources. Um, some notable updates, does that say eight minutes out oh, left? <laughs> um, at the NOP, in terms of their capacity to do their job, they've added more staff, they've provided more online training resources for certifiers, um, they have improved their import oversight activities such that they took sweeping enforcement actions to remove bad actors in the Black Sea region. And they're preparing for further rulemaking on enforcement and oversight as directed by the Farm Bill. Um, to look at the outcomes of the NOP's work is where I'd like to start. And that's looking at the growing body of evidence of the positive impacts that certified organic production has on the, on people and the planet. Um, so in terms of soil health, organic soils I have shown through recent research to have 26% more carbon storage capacity. In terms of human health, consumers are able to greatly reduce their exposure to harmful chemicals and additives by choosing certified organic products. Farm workers are safer by avoiding exposure to dangerous chemicals on the farm. Organic farmers themselves are more profitable um, income for organic farmers has nearly doubled in the past five years. On average, organic farmers are, are, can be up to 30% more profitable than their conventional counterparts. Young farmers are entering organic more than they are conventional. The average organic farmer is six years younger. Uh, organic farms are contributing to job growth. 50% um, of organic businesses have increased their full-time staff in the last year. And in terms of rural economic development, certified organic production is contributing to, um, uh, clus actually there's a study showing that clusters of certified organic activity is correlated with lower rates of poverty and higher median incomes in those areas. So because the NOP program is delivering these measurable benefits, that's why I can say that yes, the NOP is doing a good job in terms of supporting those values and protecting human health and the environment. And there's also evidence to show that the NOP program is beating consumer expectations, and we can see that by the increasing uh, rates of US uh, retail sales of organic foods. The organic market is uh, growing at six times the rate of the overall food market, and that demand is bringing in new entrants into certified organic production. Um, overall, the number of certified organic operations has grown in the last five years. It's grown almost 40%. And just last year, there were 1,000 new certified organic operations in the US. But there's a real threat, real threat in front of us. And that's when inconsistent application of the standards is combined with inactivity to advance new standards to correct and fill um, those gaps. 
and that's happening in livestock with the origin, um, organic livestock and poultry practices rule that was published but withdrawn. It's happening with dairy with the origin of livestock rule. A proposed rule was published, but it's been withdrawn. And in fact, over the last 10 years, there are 20 recommendations out of the NOSB. And guess how many have been finalized through rulemaking? Zero. That's where the NOP is failing. That's the NOP not doing their job. That's the USDA failing to hold up their end of this public-private partnership between the NOSB and the public, that citizen advisory board, and their responsibility to implement those recommendations through rulemaking. Um, and that unlevel playing field is detrimental for farmers across the board. Um, it puts them at an economic disadvantage. It creates consumer mistrust because the consumer doesn't know what to think. Um, and it's an overall inability for the program to keep up with consumer expectations and an evolving dynamic market. So at OTA, we recognize these failures. We aren't afraid to voice them. We sued the USDA over the OLPP rule. So I don't know what says we're not afraid to act other than um, that sort of action against the very you know, holder of this other end of the public-private partnership. But we're focusing on solutions. Um, so we are committed to bringing bold and lasting structural changes to repair this public-private partnership. We need to get the USDA to work better for us. So we've been thinking um, about long-term solutions. You know, we can't fight rule by rule. We can't sue every time a rule doesn't get published. Um, so how can we fix this part of the process? Um, we've started thinking about some structural changes that we could move forward in some sort of draft bill of some sort. We're calling it the continuous improvement and advancement of standards concept. Um, some of the ideas I'm going to share with you just a few, but I brought some handouts I'd love for you guys to take a look at, give us feedback. You know, this is, these are just ideas we're kind of chewing on at the moment. We have about two and a half minutes left. Okay, great. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to give you just maybe one juicy tidbit from this list of ideas of how we can repair this partnership. Um, we'd like to see a model for standards development that's customized to a voluntary program. Organic farmers are choosing, they're opting in to this regulation, which makes it totally different than any other mandatory standard. So we'd like to see some mechanism where an NOSB recommendation automatically goes on the USDA unified agenda. <laughs> done. Like, it goes there, it's required, and it must be implemented through rulemaking in a given time frame. Let's get that, you know, legislated and codified that that's an um, affirmative obligation for the USDA to move forward. And if the USDA chooses to take something off of that unified regulatory agenda, they must be transparent about why and communicate to the public why a consensus recommendation was taken off the agenda and take accountability for that decision. So we've got some other ideas here around um, redefining the cost-benefit analysis. The way it's, doing, it's done now by the Office of Management and Budget is they're only looking at the cost of um, coming into compliance with the new standard, but they're not looking at the cost of status quo. What about those producers that are already in compliance and are at an economic disadvantage because, because others are um, using a loophole or something? So this is going to be a big lift. We think it's worth it. We think it's worth it to continue dedicating and committing to fixing this federal program. Nothing else is going to bring the enforcement of a federal program. People can go to jail over, you know, fraudulently claiming organic products. That's huge. Nothing can bring the consumer awareness of the USDA organic seal. And I think we owe it to the 27,000 certified operations in the U.S that are currently certified, that are investing in organic certification, that rely on the USDA seal to make this work, to keep this program going. What can we do? So despite the flaws, despite the failures, the NOP program is still delivering, delivering a tremendous amount of benefit to the people on the planet. We can fix it. It's worth it. I invite support from this group. We've been sharing these ideas with some um, partner nonprofits, and we'd like to see what we can do to fix it. It's worth it. Thank you. Got 15 seconds left. Wonderful.
Uh, now we'll hear from, uh, let me just get my timer set here again. Now we'll hear from Dave Carlson for 10 minutes. Dave. Dave I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Dave Chapman, I'm sorry. I'm guy. Yeah. We're listening. Okay. Yeah. Sound okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to thank Joe for showing up. Um, <laughs> And I also am intimidated by this situation. I, I am getting more used to speaking in public, but I'm not used to a debate. And I promised Jack that we would disagree. So uh, he said, I don't want any more of these damn panels, right? So actually, Joe and I don't disagree about most things, and we disagree about a few things. But I'm going to bring a different emphasis here. So um, are we looking? Yes. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful commercial chicken operation in Texas, certified organic. And um, I think that this is what all of us believe an uh, organic chicken farm ought to look like. And this is what most organic chicken farms, maybe not in number, but in terms of yield, this is what they look like. Right now, this is certified farm. And um, in a conversation with Miles McAvoy, he told me that if the animal welfare reform that, that Joe and OTA and I and Real Organic and Knock and NOFA, everybody wants to have been put through, if it had been put through, this would have been decertified. And he said over 75% of the organic eggs in America would have been decertified. That's a staggering figure. And that's from the head of the National Organic Program. And it's higher now. That was 2016 that he said that. So it's got to be over 80% of the certified organic eggs are not coming from this. They're coming from this. Well, oops, I already moved into dairy. But that's the same idea. So the same thing is happening in dairy. It's not as high. You know, the best guess that we have is about 50% of the milk is coming from a CAFO. Perhaps people, some people don't know what a CAFO is. We just inspected a real organic farmer yesterday and he had never heard of the term. So it's a CAFO, it's an acronym, it's a USDA acronym for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. And the idea is that the cows live in this building and you grow the feed somewhere else and bring it to them. This is pretty much where um, conventional dairy is going in America very quickly. And unfortunately, it's also where conventional organic dairy is going very quickly. So at the same time that every state is having real organic dairy farmers pushed out of business, CAFOs are being built and certified as organic by the USDA. And I agree with Joe. I think this is illegal. I think it's against the rules. Their rules are not being enforced, but it's happening on a massive scale. This is not a small outlier issue. This is what we think an organic farm should look like. It's Francis Tickey, who has served on just about everything, including the USDA. This is what more and more they are getting to look like. And, um, you know, these are, these are farms put in the desert where it's an unnatural place to put a farm and, and they're trucking in all the food from somewhere else. So it's not this. This is Butterworks yogurt, you know, and true uh, organic pioneers and heroes. Um, and their farm is seriously challenged right now. It's very hard for them to compete with these CAFOs. Harder and harder all the time. So we're losing our organic dairy farmers, the ones who are farming the way we want, who are providing the milk that people want to buy. It's true that the demand for organic is going up and up. People are desperate because they don't want to buy from this. And they think instead they're buying from this. And they're being misled. And the question is, do we remain quiet about it? Do we participate in the fraud or do we say what we know is the truth? This is what 
a real organic blueberry farm looks like. It's quite beautiful. Uh, the man who owns this farm came and spoke at the Dartmouth Symposium this year. This is what a Driscoll's container blueberry farm looks like. Hydroponic. They have over a thousand acres of this, and I think well over a thousand acres of hydroponic production. This is a nice shot of a real organic farm, which is, you know, basically almost a wildlife refuge. I, I mean, I know this farmer. It's a spectacular place down in Florida. And he right now is facing bankruptcy because of these people. This is a hydroponic operation, fully, fully certified by USDA and celebrated. This is what his field looks like. This is what their field looks like. Again, this is happening on a massive scale. It's happening in Mexico massively. The flood of imports is going to put this guy out of business. And some of you might have heard about the great glyphosate debate. I was intimately involved in that. This would be an example of a farm that probably used glyphosate prior to laying down the black plastic, putting on pots, and getting certified the next week. Now we fix that, right? Because we raised a ruckus, not because we were quiet, not because we talked about it behind closed doors, because I did talk about it with Jenny Tucker behind closed doors, and what she said is that's allowed, and this is a settled issue. And when we started to talk about it out loud, and a lot of people got involved, including OTA, they backed down. And it's the first significant win that I can think of since 2010. There have been lots of small victories, but we're talking about major things of like, how do we define organic? What does it mean? What does it mean to us? What does it mean to consumers? What does it mean to farms? This is soil-grown greenhouse tomatoes, okay. This is hydroponic greenhouse tomatoes. This is the norm in the American supermarket right now. This is how they're grown. This is a hydroponic operation. All the feed is provided as a liquid feed. They're growing in coconut husks. There's no nutrition in coconut husks. And there's no soil involved. They will put, I take that back, they will put a small amount of compost in with the husks and blend it in. When we started the conversation, Driscoll's didn't do anything. It was straight cocoa or peat. And then they realized that's stupid. Oh, we use compost too. So, but it doesn't change the reality. About two and a half minutes left. So, how did this happen? This happened because there are a relatively small group of people who had a great deal of money at stake and they worked very hard and very strategically to bend the rules and change the regulations. This is Theo Crisantes, whom I personally like, so this isn't like a personal thing. He represented the Coalition for Sustainable Organics, which should be called the Coalition for Hydroponic Organics, and I usually just call it the Coalition for Darkness. And I call it that because their whole goal is to mislead us, is to mislead you. And if, if they were honest, they would call it the Coalition for Hydroponic Organic. That's why they were created. And they were created a few weeks after Pat Leahy sent a letter to Vilsack saying hydroponics should not be allowed. And we decided that in 2010, get on it. And they went to town, they paid a lobbyist $20,000, and they testified to both the House and the Senate. And when Theo testified to the Senate, he asked for four things, certification of hydroponic production, reform of the NOP, getting rid of the sunset rule, greater representation for large corporations on the NOSB, and an end to efforts to create stronger animal welfare standards for chickens. And all of this has come to pass, right? He won everything. This guy represents a hundred hydroponic farmers. It's not even an American, not that there's anything wrong with not being an American, but this became the voice of organic to the Senate and the House. The Washington Post blew a lot of this open. They had big article about CAFO dairy, big article about CAFO eggs, and big article about fraudulent grain imports. And that changed a lot of things in the international conversation. <laughs> That's 
That's nice. I had an old soundtrack. So we fought the law and the law won. What happens next? So we started the Real Organic Project and I won't have time to talk about it right now. If you're interested, we can talk about it. But I like this quote I'll end with from Ben Franklin. Democracy is two wolves in a land voting on what to have for lunch. Liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. <laughs> so we must contest the vote. Thank you, Dave. Um, we, we now will give each uh, participant uh, four minutes to uh, contest the other one's uh, <coughs> claims and, and rebut any arguments. And Joanna, you can go first. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Dave. Thanks for pointing out the areas where we agree. That feels good. Um, the the origin. Sorry, I keep the O oh, and organic livestock and poultry practices keeps mixing me up because we're really focused on the origin of livestock rule too. Anyway, that that regulation is is critical to address some of these major inconsistencies, and I'm compelled by. Um, your observa true observation that the longer that that rule is not enacted, these operations just have more time to invest and get bigger, and they're driving a lot of the consumer growth, and so the timeliness of advancing rulemaking is so critical. But I do want to take just a minute to say another something about our concepts about continuous improvement that will address that issue that Dave brought up about um, taking too much time and certifiers getting entrenched in what they're allowing based on an internal policy um, and not letting that get ahead of the rulemaking process. So one of the concepts we're looking at is um, establishing some sort of interpretive review panel that would be some combination of USDA and OP staff, certifiers, um, maybe an NO NOSB members, the certifier seat, that could address um, time-sensitive standards interpretation questions in a way that will give certifiers an authoritative you know, instruction from the NOP that they can all use to firm and have confidence in their internal policies. Right now, certifiers feel like if it's not really clear in the rule, they can make a policy to the best of their effort and there's no requirement to adjust or change to meet another certifier's interpretation or implementation of that rule. And without an instruction from the NOP or a rulemaking, it's, it's hard for certifiers to feel confident in changing their policies. Um, so some sort of interpretive review panel could address these time-sensitive questions, novel interpretations of the standard, new production systems. Let's try to get certifiers on the same page early. And if it's something that is significant enough that it needs an NOSB recommendation, it needs to be addressed through rulemaking, then it can kind of go off and do the NOSB thing. But is there a process that we can use to get more firm consensus earlier? Um, during the, the standards development process. So again, some of our ideas um, on the glyphosate issue, um, I'd like to highlight that as a, agree, a, kind of a win, right? It's like, it it's of kind of, kind Absolutely. of. Um, but I thought it was, you know, I, I came to the symposium in, in Hanover and heard about the glyphosate use, and I was shocked. I was like, "There's no." I've been a certifier. There's no way I couldn't imagine how that could be allowed. And so I started emailing my certifier friends. But then hearing what Jenny Tucker had said was especially shocking. And so I think the the raising of the ruckus, and then here comes OTA with our very technical official letter signed on signed on by our members. You know that sort of double whammy was enough to produce the um, clarification memo that ultimately came out from the NOP, you know, clearly saying, no, this glyphosate is not allowed right before transition. You have to do the three year, just like everybody else, whether you're in a field and covering it in plastic or not. So it's not a settled issue whatsoever. Last point. Thank you. Dave? Um, it was wonderful to see the community come together on that. In case you didn't know, 
what Jenny Tucker said that was so outrageous was that the use of glyphosate would not prohibit somebody from being certified a week before certification and in the case of hydroponics. So, I, I, she knew about this before we started talking about it. Everybody knew about it before we started talking about it. I had brought it up with the head of the OTA months earlier. It was when Jenny said that, that the world hit the fan because it was not about whether it was happening, it was about whether it was allowed. Um, but I would say that she has a, continued to ignore the other half of what we are saying. They're still allowing this in greenhouses. And apparently, she refuses to clarify. So you can bomb a greenhouse with a pesticide this week, bring in new coco coir next week, and be certified. That's not right. That's not what organic means. And, and about the letter from OTA, the thing that bothers me is it was signed by the two biggest hydroponic producers in the country. I'm glad that they agree with us on this, but it sidesteps the basic issue of whether or not organic farming is going to take place in the ground. Is it a system that is based on soil fertility, or is it a system that's based on some kind of plant available liquid or non-liquid supplement? And, and not a supplement, a replacement for soil. So that's a really basic issue about what does it mean to be organic. There are many great talks about that here, and I hope everyone goes to hear Chris Nichols tonight, because she's great, you know? And to talk about this amazing miracle of what's going on in the soil, that's what makes us organic. That was the whole point. We thought that that made people healthier, made animals healthier, made plants healthier, and as it turns out, makes the climate healthier. These are not simple issues, but that was the belief system that motivated the organic movement. And a great deal of that, obviously, is being lost now. And the question is, for me, whether we will stand up and say no, because it's not a matter of some small reforms. Things were going pretty badly with the NOP when Tom Vilsack was the secretary. Eight years of Obama, and we were getting our asses kicked. Unfortunately, and I campaigned for Obama twice. You know, I support him, but I did not support the decisions of the USDA under his tenure. It got much worse under Trump, yes. And you know, the, 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 the very first day that Trump's administration came in, they pulled the animal welfare reform for further study. And, and three months later, they rejected it completely. So the question is, you know, what do we stand for? What does organic mean? Because if we let it mean what, there's a, there's a great deal of money in this conversation, right? $50 billion and some, $53 billion in annual sales last year. And it's going up. And it's going up for the best of reasons. It's going up because people are hungry to find an alternative to the conventional system, which is what organic is becoming. So, if we want to offer a genuine alternative, because when they find out that this is what they're getting, they're going to be pissed off, and rightfully so. And if we remain silent, they're going to be pissed off at us too, and rightfully so. You know, we should be creating an alternative system, and we can lead a great many good things in the world by doing that. How am I doing? Five seconds left. All right, Very go good. ahead. <laughs> All right, we have uh, come to the time when we are going to invite questions from the floor. Uh, I would like you to ask a question of one or the other, and the Malone who's most recently spoken uh, asked the question of the other one, so we continue to have a back and forth, and no long lead-in questions, maybe a, a sentence or two explaining who you are, why you're asking the question, and then get to it if you can. All right, is there a question for Joanna? <clears throat> yes. Um, Joe, thank you for being here. Um, I'm wondering about the continuous improvement initiative that OTA is putting forth. Does that require opening up the Organic Food Production Act of 1990 to remedy these things you're putting on the table? Thanks for the question. It probably will, because um, another one of the concepts we're looking at is um, structurally changing the 
um, requirements in the law to include continuous improvement. Um, when we were, you know, reeling in frustration over the inaction and um, withdrawal of the OLPP rule, we and we're starting to develop some of these concepts. We're like, oh well, organic is continuous improvement. It must be in the law somewhere. Um, and unfortunately, I think maybe a lot of us have had that disappointment where like it must be in the law. These things we feel are true. Um, so. Uh, inserting a definition of continuous improvement into the law is something that's been discussed. Again, these are just ideas we're sort of marinating on. Um, a requirement to uh, have NOSB recommendations go directly onto the USDA's unified agenda for rulemaking will likely need some sort of amendment to the law. Um, so this this is a big a big lift. It's a big conversation to have, and we want to get it right. Um, Isn't that dangerous? That's the other part of my question because there's a lot of entities out there in the $53 billion signs that are floating around that the minute you open off, uh, all sorts of things can come in for watering down, actually. Or, um, you know, we all have a laundry list that we would like to see changes made to clarify and. Um, make organic stronger, but one of the things that's held people back. Don't you see what you're referring to? Okay. Um, <laughs> is that it's very dangerous to do? Is that being considered by OTA? Yes, absolutely. And um, to fend against that risk, we want to build as much consensus as possible before sharing these ideas. Um, uh, to, to get to a place where we're actually going to some sort of regulatory um, decision making. So we've, we've engaged with these concepts with some of our um, coalition partners like the Organic Farmers Association. We've briefed their staff on these topics and we've offered to give a full briefing to their membership and policy committee. We've um, worked with the National Organic Coalition on these concepts, again, briefed their staff, offered to give you know, more of like a listening session, working session, brainstorming to get really into the details of what would the wording look like? Which part of OFPA gets changed? You know, very specific and strategic changes that can bring about meaningful differences in how we implement this, this federal program. It's not working now. It doesn't it doesn't work when the National Organic Standards Board spends 15 years building consensus around animal welfare. We spend another several years going through public rulemaking. We finally get to a final rule, and it goes away. That doesn't work. So, um, sorry, I'm directing my anger at you. <laughs> okay, I think you got an answer there. Thank you. Okay. Is there a question for, for Dave Chapman? I'm, I'm Go ahead, Dave. I want you to make a comment to this. Uh, Jenny Tucker. What was it? A, not a regulation, but a comment she made about the blueberry operations in, in, in Florida. The um, memo? Yeah. The where memo. she clarified things? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if these are like laws or you can build one or the other, but I, I think that was the correct thing. But if you read the law, the law actually says any farm or parcel must comply with the, you know, all the soil, pesticide, whatever regulation. She just applied that to one aspect, which was the pesticides. But I feel if you cover a, a farm or field with, pe with plastic, that is a parcel. And that land underneath that plastic is dead. It's dying. So do you see any opportunity in that, uh, what you call it, a uh, not a proposal, but a memo? The memo, yeah. That we could take that further and say, well, why, why can't you apply <laughs> it to the, to the soil fertility that's under that plastic? So there are um, a number of lawsuits going around and, and NOP is getting sued all the time. Um, they don't like it, um, but it's not what uh, Real Organic is doing. Um, we have friends who are uh, in NOC. NOC has a lawsuit, OTA has a lawsuit. Um, they're suing about animal welfare. They're suing about, not OTA, but the others are suing about or getting ready to sue about hydroponic. And you know, I know that the Center for Food Safety says this is illegal. It's clearly illegal. We will win the lawsuit. I do not have that kind of faith, and I think if they do win the lawsuit, somehow it's not going to change things. So I'm not against it. I greatly support it. But we're working on a, 
let's say, a more homemade solution, which is, you know, after Jacksonville, Jacksonville was a big NOSB meeting in which the NOSB failed to pass a recommendation that would have tightened the, the, the standards prohibiting hydroponic and clarified the great container loophole. Um, and that, I, I can talk about that in the next two minutes if you would like. Um, it's, a, it, it's a big deal. But um, after Jacksonville, I felt that we are not in the next 10 years going to be able to reform the, uh, the National Organic Program. I, everybody that I knew and, and a lot of people in this room have worked at it very hard for many years and it was going down, 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 not up, not level. It was getting worse and worse. So that's why we started the Real Organic Project as like just an attempt to create an add-on label, which is common in Europe, lots of them there, that that people could, in fact, know what they were getting and choose it. Our standards aren't strict. They're basically not organic uh, 3.0, they're organic 1.0. They're, they're basically just the Organic Food Production Act actually enforced. <coughs> so that's my response to it. I think there are definitely lawyers who are looking at it. And uh, when I met with uh, Miles, Jenny's predecessor, and with Eleanor Starmer, his boss, and she said the reason that they couldn't support um, a moratorium on hydroponics was that they would get sued. <laughs> I, I, I believe her. I'm sure they would have gotten sued, but she said you've got to do it through the regular process. She said, I support you. I wrote the letter. And we, you know, that's one thing that just really important to remember when we talk about the USDA or National Organic Program or OTA or any organization, we have to understand these are not monolithic organizations. They have a lot of different people with different opinions. We need to appeal to the ones who are friends within there and see if we can work towards a solution. Thank you, Dave. Do we have a question for Joe? Liz. In the earlier days after the um, law was passed, I was one of the people from NOFA who worked uh, in some of the committees of the OTA. I was a member of the accreditation committee, and we made a very strong recommendation that that be made a top priority of OTA um, to make sure that accreditation was done even-handedly. And it was people in the Quality Assurance Council who were people who have since benefited from that uneven accreditation, who run some of the cow CAFOs, who vetoed that. There is a lot of distrust in, among organic farmers for OTA because of past record. There was a time when OTA discussed having a code of conduct. Would you consider kicking out members who are benefiting by working in contradiction from the things that you very sincerely present to us? Um, thank you for the question. Um, I'm well aware of the views of OTA from um, and and I, you know, coming in and working at OTA. I've, this is my one year anniversary. Um, and, you know, I'm really proud to work for OTA, and that's my experience from, from my time as an employee and also from my 10 years prior as a member of OTA through Organic Materials Review Institute and Pennsylvania Certified Organic. Um, so to speak to the, the process by which OTA does their policy development, I feel really confident I can speak to the, the process by which we develop task forces and try to come to consensus in a manner that uh, speaks with the unifying voice of our members while still aligning with our mission and our core value statement. Um, in preparation for this debate, I did go back to make sure that all of our um, governing policies were publicly available on our website so I could direct you all to them. And yes, go to our website and the governing um, uh, principles, or sorry, governing policy document is on the board page. And there is a section there just after the code of ethics 
and the uh, values statement, the core value statement, that describes the uh, dispute resolution process when a member is um, not complying with the code of ethics and the core values. There is a procedure, it's formalized, it's approved by the board, um, and should be exercised if there's a valid concern. Um, I have another minute. I could speak about our membership. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Thank you. Is there a question, question for Dave? Yes. No, I was thinking the guy, the guy okay, this behind you. Um, for Dave and your other illustrious debater, perhaps, um, we're talking about specific issues in which maybe the NOP has violated certain principles and uh, aspects of the statute. I'd like to take a step back and ask you about the process by which the board um, carries out its responsibility, statutory responsibility. So the board was established to manage the national list, but also advise the secretary of agriculture. In 2013, uh, one major authority the board was taken away, and that was to establish its agenda, uh, its program, its work plan, and ensure that the stakeholders carry out the responsibilities that were intended by Congress. And therefore, some of the discussions we have at the NOSB meetings may not reflect what the community wants to discuss at a particular meeting or work on as part of their work plan. Have, do you see OTA, representing the industry, uh, sort of complicit in the demise of this process that no longer allows the stakeholder organizations to raise issues of importance and get them fully debated before the public and with the public. Jeez, Jay. <laughs> okay, so um, Jay is a former member of the NOSB and served for five years, and so he definitely knows whereof he speaks. Um, yes, obviously OTA has been the big dog in the room, uh, has worked closely with the National Organic Program, and uh, has helped shepherd through these changes. I don't think that's mysterious. Um, and I think, I think what you're saying, you know, setting aside OTA for a minute, but just like, what does this mean for us? What I think it means is that, you know, one of the things that Jenny Tucker says, if, we, if, if you were to talk with her and bring up in a public venue the issue of hydroponic certification, she would say that's a settled issue. That's a settled issue, meaning I'm not going to talk about it, I'm not going to consider it. And I have said to her, Jenny, this is not a settled issue. Look at the community. You just met with the Organic Farmers Association and you had 20 members who were saying this is not a settled issue. So we have this sort of magical thinking going on on the part of the USDA. And the question is, what do we do about it? Because they do have the power to uh, change the conversation. And I think, again, we need to make a ruckus. So um, if, I, if I could, I guess I can, because I have a, a minute or so left. Yep. So uh, <laughs> um, there was a, this is a Michael Pollan story that, that when Bill Clinton was presenting his first budget, and he'd come in with Robert Reich and, and way to the left. And he had been pushed by the forces of Congress further and further to the right. And he presented a very middle of the road much more middle than he meant it to be. And afterwards, he's like yelling at Bernie Sanders saying, why didn't you yell at me? Well, I needed you to yell at me. Why didn't you yell at me? And the point is, and I've heard this from high-ranking members of the USDA for us, we need to speak up. We need to not accept defeat. We need to not say, oh, well, if you say so, it must be that way. Because it's not right, it's not legal, and we'll let the lawyers try and work that out but I can't do that. But I can say it's not right. And, and I promise you that as we do this, they are forced to listen. It doesn't mean we win, but at least we will lose with some dignity. And, um, and we will build something else. One thing I say, organic was not meant as a brand. It was meant as an agricultural movement. 
And the brand was a way of promoting that and connecting the community of eaters with the community of farmers and build one community, one organic movement. And if we somehow confuse organic with certified organic, with USDA certified organic, I think we're making a terrible mental mistake. Okay. Well Uh, we have come to the uh, <clears throat> 10 minutes left in our program, and we will ask Dave, in this case, to be the first to uh, sum up his position in five minutes. Okay. Um, you know, as we've gotten into um, a, a national and, and even international debate, because it is one food system around the world now, um, it's... Um, it's been difficult to bring up uh, the subject, the, the pictures I showed, the, the, the things that I've said. It's easy to um, be assigned the task of being the, the angry outsider. Um, the Coalition for Darkness has said we're just afraid of competition, right? It's like quite the opposite. I would like honest competition. I look forward to the day when the hydroponic tomatoes has a picture of the hydroponic you know, row on the cover. And I look forward to the day when the CAFO milk has a picture of a cow in a CAFO instead of a cow in a pasture, right? Yes. So I'm not afraid of honest competition. Bring it on. What I'm afraid of is a system in which real organic farmers are being pushed out of the market, and this is happening, and all of us, and I'm a shopper too, lose the choice of buying organic food. And, and that's not right. And we don't have to put up with it. So we can get together. And if we do, we have tremendous power. Um, I had one more thing to say. Mm. Oh, yeah, OK. So people, people accuse us of being arsonists. And you know, because the house is on fire. And we are not arsonists. We are firefighters. We did not set the fire. And don't blame us because the house is on fire. And we're firefighters because people we love are still in that house, right? We are trying to put out the fire. And I'll say, and I'll, I'll extend this to Joe, we do need to do it as a very large community because we're facing much bigger issues even than just personal nutrition. We're facing climate change. We're facing real issues that we know agriculture has got to be not just part of the answer, but the center part of the answer. So to do that, we need ultimately to bring government along. We do. I think we can, we can feed ourselves without government, but I don't think we're going to be able to deal with climate change without government. So my goal is not to abolish government. It's not to abolish the OTA. I would like to convert the OTA because they need some conversion. And I'd like to convert the government, and it's not impossible. I was amazed in that hearing that we were talking about with Greg Iboff speaking, a number of Congress people we're saying the right thing. They were like quoting us. I was like, well, you go. You know, some Republican from Indiana is like, fantastic. The word is getting out. And we need to keep talking about it. Real Organic was basically created as an educational effort, not as a branding effort. We need, we need to create a label that we can trust. But we need to educate ourselves about what Real Organic means. I have a long way to go. Such a privilege to listen to Chris and go, OK, I didn't get that right. I didn't get that right. We don't know. We're all babies at this. We're just trying to figure it out. So go to realorganicproject.org, right? Sign our petition and you know, help join this. Look at the videos. We have tremendous videos of, called Know Your Farmer. And you can see we only have you know, 10 or 12 made now, but more are coming all the time. We got over 90 farms certified with us now. We're going to get them all in the end. We're going to get them all. All right? So thank you very much. Joe? Great. Um, we've covered a lot. I'm, I'm really happy to have come, Dave. <laughs> um, I think I'll start with maybe a comment about solutions um, and acknowledging, you know, I, I feel like we're very much in agreement that there is systemic failure in the current program. 
And the reaction to that systemic failure, whether you dig in and try and work on the program or try the homemade approach or try a lawsuit, there's lots of different options. Um, and and I, I'm truly advocating for digging in and trying to fix this program for the benefit of you know the many um, people that have come before me to build this program. I look up, literally, <laughs> looking up to all of you um, and for all of the organic farmers that are out there relying on the label. Um, I think an add-on label is a, can be a really complementary um, solution to communicate to consumers and having the USDA organic program as a baseline I think is critical. So I'm extending thanks and appreciation for that. Um, it shows the organic program where it needs to go because as the add-on label gains traction, all right, you've paved the way for the program, let's do that. Um, and it also keeps the farmers, you know, they can um, still have their choice to choose the add-on label but retain certification, get access to the other USDA programs that are available that depend on organic certification like risk management, crop insurance, um, cost share, conservation programs. Um, but at the end of the day, an add-on program to a broken system is still broken. So I invite help and collaboration to fix the failure in the public-private partnership and to get USDA to work better with this community and advance standards in a way that keeps up with consumer expectation, that meets the needs of the industry for fair, uniform, consistently applied standards. Um, we've got to start to some ideas, but we want to really work on them so that we can find a big, bold, lasting solution that can make this program work. It's, it's worth committing the effort to do so. Um, I'm here willing to do it. Take a handout, call me, talk to me. I'd love to hear some of the ideas from the NOFA community. Um, and other calls to action, I'd encourage you to stay engaged, ask questions. If you've got quest other questions about the Organic Trade Association or positions, let me share the information. I would love nothing more than to have that opportunity. Um, you know, the organic program is, is you know, not only suffering from the inaction on advancement of standards, but we've also got other threats. At the hearing that Dave and I have just been talking about, the congressional hearing, um, yes, there was a lot of support for organic. People are getting the message, but there were also suggestions that, oh, maybe gene editing should be allowed in organic. Uh -huh. yeah. Or maybe the three-year transition is too long. So we need to be prepared for these threats to the program we have now. Like, we can't go backwards. We um, were, you know, we're very frustrated with the status quo, but there is no way we will accept weakening of standards in that way. So. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to really work together and find big structural changes that can help make this work. Um, so stay engaged and talk to me about continuous improvement. Thanks. Okay, it is 5.30 and I guess that's the end of the program. I think these guys may be willing to stay around and answer a few questions if they have something very specific. So thank you all very much for coming. And Dave has a conference coming up. When's your conference? Oh, yes, one last announcement. There's going to be a symposium at Dartmouth College. We had one this past spring. It's going to be next April, I believe. And it was fantastic. So I really encourage you to come. Thank you. Thank you. Very yeah. yeah, you did a very nice job. You're a very fine moderator. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah.